Do you know what a doppelganger is? I mean, like Will Ferrell, uh, the comedian, and Chad Smith of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Two people who look alike, but they really don't have anything to do with each other. Well, I don't know if you noticed, but I have a, 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 a name that is very similar to that of a celebrity. But it doesn't mean I'm funny or I even look like him. It certainly doesn't say anything about the affinities we have as far as our faith is concerned. But today, I think that what we're going to talk about in my guest that I'm going to have is going to blow your mind. Stay tuned. You're listening to Mainline with your host, Reverend Stephen D. Martin. Yes, this is your host, Reverend Stephen D. Martin. But I have a very special guest for you today by the name of Stephen D. Martin. No, I'm not my own guest on my own podcast. I mean, this is crazy, crazy stuff. One of those things that you only imagine might happen someday, but when it actually does, wow, it's uh, it's a little trippy. So my guest today is Stephen D. Martin. And before I get into that too much, before I say too much about it right now, I'm just going to say this guy's pretty cool. He's got a pretty cool name, pretty cool guy. But wow, what a similar path in life we have followed. Stay tuned. Before we get in too deep here, I'm going to uh, lay some stuff on you that I think you need to pay attention to. First of all, I want to raise the question of who do you who do you talk to when you are struggling with major leadership questions in ministry? Do you talk to your superiors? Do you talk to your peers? Do you find that those people either have kind of a bias involved, a power dynamic that doesn't end up being very helpful? Or just simply that they're not the right people to talk to in any given situation. If that's the case and you really want to take your leadership skills to the next level, I encourage you to try hiring a coach. Clergy coaches can really bring out the very, very best in you and your ministry. And I think this is an important thing to talk about because we oftentimes in church circles think of coaches as being something of a kind of a remedial thing that if you're messing up or having a hard time in your church, you, your conference or your jurisdiction might um, assign a coach to you to work with you to try to get you to perform better. Well, in the corporate world, that's not the way it works. High dollar executives hire coaches on their own so they can take their skills to the next level. Coaching isn't like therapy. It's not digging through your past to try to heal from some wound. It's it's not like consulting, which brings in another person to tell you what you should do or what your organization should do. Coaching is about having a kind of a fellow traveler alongside you, asking questions so that you can think more clearly and see the possibilities in ways that you weren't able to see them before. I think that's why coaching is a perfect fit for ministry. At the Lakelands Institute, we do a couple of things around coaching. One is that we have, a, we have several coaches who work with us and who are ready to work with you. The other thing is we offer comprehensive coach training for clergy. Let's just say that maybe you want to add coaching to your ministry portfolio. The Lakelands Institute can offer you a course, a curriculum, a path forward that will, if you complete it, end up with certification, real credentials. I urge you to take a look at our website. That's lakelandsinstitute.com and check out all of the possibilities that we have around coaching, whether that's being coached or becoming a coach. Please take this opportunity seriously because I'm not the only one who thinks that coaching may be the next great horizon 
and skill in ministry. Social media has opened up all kinds of doors. I remember when I first got on Facebook, it was the thing that I really enjoyed the most about it was being able to connect with people from my past and and be able to, you know, say, hey, let's go have lunch. Let's meet up. Let's reconnect after 20, 25 years. And I had a lot of really good lunches out of that. I think social media has become something else uh, over the last few years. And I think we're all trying to figure out what it means to us, even as we still find ourselves kind of addicted to our little, uh, as I call them, little computers, interconnected computers that we carry around in our pockets. Today's story is a really kind of a cool, positive story about the power of social media to connect. And it's also a story about how things just kind of happen. And they happen in odd ways, and they happen probably because they are supposed to. I'm not a big guy that's into predestination and trying to discern God's plan for everything, but I do know when something happens that's a bit out of the ordinary for the way we usually live our lives, and I love paying attention to those things when they happen. So with that, I'm going to introduce to you my guest, Stephen D. Martin. Steve. Welcome Steve. To- <laughs> Welcome to the Mainline Podcast. How are you today? Oh, pretty good, man. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> good. I'm clearing my throat. Um, yeah, I haven't talked a lot today yet, so. Okay. Well, you're in Fort Collins, Colorado, correct? Yep. All yeah. right. Yeah, I'm in uh, the greater Washington, D.C. area. So how's the weather in Fort Collins? You got, uh, you know, hurricanes? Do you have uh, <laughs> fires, smoke, anything like that? Uh, today's actually pretty nice. It's 77. It's going to be, it's going to be hot today in like 94 degrees, but it's a dry heat. So, you know, it's not bad. We have a very, very wet heat going over here. It's, yeah. uh, yeah, it's, it's so, it's so humid that when we got up this morning, all of our windows were completely, you know, fogged over because of the condensation oh. on the outside. Just, just hideous. It, it just doesn't get much better in August. So, Yeah. I, yeah, humidity and me do not agree. <laughs> yeah, me neither. But I'm 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 down with it. So, um, you know, uh, I <laughs> we met online, <clears throat> right. and it was just the most hilarious. Gosh, I'm really <clears throat> excuse me. It was just the most hilarious thing to me, and I find humor in all kinds of crazy spots. But uh, tell me, <laughs> tell me what your name is. My name is Stephen D. Martin. And that's funny because my name is Stephen D. Martin. What? <laughs> I know. I, I, I saw you, you like friend requested me on Facebook. I'm like, wait, what? Is somebody like <laughs> spamming me? Is it like duping my account or something? I mean, I, I, I think you probably noticed that there are other people in the world named Steve Martin, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's a couple. Yeah, a couple. A, I've heard of or I've heard of one, one or two. Yeah. There's one or two. Um, and and so uh, you know, I don't know if you've gone through this or not, but uh, I had a I had a fairly public pos- position in my uh, ministry the last several years, and um, I, I wanted to be Googleable. I don't know if that's really something you should desire, but I you know I wanted people to be able to find me. Um, sure. So uh, and I knew that if they searched for Steve Martin. That wasn't going to uh, yield any results about me. Yeah. So if I wanted to be Googleable, I had to be, have a different name. So I always kind of professionally went with Stephen D. Martin. So that's what yeah. my uh, Facebook um, persona is: Stephen D. Martin and everything else. And um, and your name is Stephen D. Martin, which yeah. is crazy. Yeah, I've always gone. <clears throat> well, I always tell people if you've known me for more than thirty years, you can usually usually call me Stephen. Like. People at church and parents and family, you know, I'm Stephen. Uh, but anybody else that has known me at all calls me Steve. And so I've always gone by Steve. And, and it's a, it's been kind of nice on some friends to not be very Googleable. <laughs> and uh, But the, the one thing I run into <clears throat> is I bought a long time ago when I was doing some freelance work for, I did freelance web design. I bought the name, uh, the, the domain name, stevemartin.me, dot me, and okay. for like for my portfolio and like how to contact me, that I could put on my resume, that kind of stuff. And I get the weirdest emails from people thinking I am Steve Martin, and it's because of my it's, it's Steve at stevemartin.me, a 
great now. Everybody's going to sign me up for stuff. But yeah. Um, but I get like people like, hey, do you remember me? I sat behind you in class in college back in down in Florida or, or wherever. <laughs> and uh, so I have like a a text expander uh, thing built in for like I think you're thinking of that you're looking for a different Steve Martin. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, I, yeah, that's, uh, I, I've had no end of fun with the whole thing over the years where there's a few years separating us. So he was, he really, the, the actor, Steve Martin got famous, uh, when you were really small, right? Yeah. I was born in 75. And, uh, and, and that, that was right in the prime of my, uh, my, uh, junior high school experience. And, um, and it was, it was just all, you know, especially when he was kind of a rock star in, uh, when I was in high school, that was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. And, uh, and, and people always ask me, let's see, has anybody ever asked you, are you a wild and crazy guy? Oh my word. (laughs) All the time. (laughs) Cat toys. Uh yeah yeah. Uh, what else? Um, King Tut. I, King Tut. Um, lately it's do I play, play the banjo? Right. Yep. Yeah. Um. Uh, I, I get wild and crazy guy a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you usually it's just a general kind of like hey cool name. So you can you can one of my many URLs I have I have stephendmartin dot com so. Sorry, oh. bud. You can fight me for that. You're who has it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. StephenDMartin.com. So, yeah. And then I've got I've got MildAndLazyGuy.com. <laughs> oh, that's great. So, that's great. yeah. And um, we have fun with this thing. Now, the really the really crazy thing about this is the, this encounter is that I didn't just like find you on a one of those Facebook groups where we you know, share similar names because there's a lot of those. This was actually on a, um, uh, I, I think it was a, a forum for uh, a group for the software we're using right now to, this is unsponsored by the way, but but the, the software we're using to record this uh, this podcast, riverside.fm. Um, and, yeah. and there, and I, and I saw a post and I saw your name and I, you, you, your, your Facebook is just Steve Martin. And, but I right. saw it and I thought, I don't remember writing that. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to look deeper. And then I saw that you, uh, you also have a, uh, you have a, a basically a, a kind of a, well, it's it, tell me about your podcast. That's probably the best way to do this. Tell me about sure. your podcast. So my podcast is called following the fire. And the idea behind the name is that we are, it's uh, it, it kind of became kind of a Christian deconstruction podcast, kind of unintentionally, because the idea was that we wanted to rethink things, rethink the, our beliefs and the way we approach things, and just follow God, just like the Israelites followed the fire and the cloud through the desert. Like, let's just figure out how to follow God and kind of pretend like we're ignoring everything else, and, and what does that look like? And both of us, me and my co-host Nathan, grew up in a church of Christ background and through the pandemic and things and lots of, you know, things happening, we kind of decided to, we needed to get together and chat about this stuff. And we're like, yeah, let's throw it in a podcast. That's, that's my approach to processing things is to make it public. Yeah. Yeah. But honestly I do, I find it a really good way to, to have conversations, really intentional conversations. Um, and, and I, I don't know if anybody listens to my podcast or not, but I like it (laughs) and, and no, I learn from it and, and I, I, uh, I, I like an intentional conversation where there's kind of a purpose around it and, and, and it's, you're having it for some reason. I guess that's kind of dumb in a lot of ways, but it's still, it works for me. So yeah. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, I always, I kind of joke, but it's like a very serious joke that the podcast for, for both of us, Nathan and I, it's for, it's very much uh, therapy because especially during the pandemic when we were so locked down, we came from a tradition that has lots of Bible classes, like Wednesday night and Sunday morning Bible classes and discussion and things like that. And we kind of lost out on that opportunity to kind of talk through some of this stuff. And it's really great to be together with him to do that and, and to hear, and I, like I said, I, like you said, I, I process things very publicly as well, and I don't know why. When, so when things happen to me, I'm like, hey, everybody, this is going on. I mean, not for attention, but I, I think it's for, more for I want feedback. I want other right. opinions and thoughts and even support when it's a tough thing. 
And I think there's some value to, um, you know, sharing your questions openly and, um, and, yeah. and somebody else might connect. Hopefully your questions are some or questions other people are having and yeah. therefore they might benefit some in some small way through your journey. Right. Yeah. And we're finding that there are a lot of people who are going through a lot of the similar things that we are. Uh, churches of Christ in the U S are not, it's not a huge group of people. I mean, they're, they're everywhere, but they're not necessarily a huge, um, numerically, but there are a lot of people who are going through struggles of trying to reconcile things that are happening in the world with the way we grew up and the way our faith was formed. And, uh, it's, we're finding that there are a lot of people who are really connecting with what we're having, what we're, what we're talking about. And, and not necessarily that we're like, we're not coming out there with answers and trying to solve things for people. I mean, we have more questions than answers. I think that's the stage. better way to be, frankly. Yeah, yeah. I th- especially at this stage, I think that's that's where we need to be. Um. So so here's the fun part. So we get together on this podcast, and 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 we have we're going to have no end of fun by you know, hey, I'm Stephen D. Martin. Well, hi, I'm <laughs> Stephen D. Martin, and we're gonna we're gonna have a lot of fun with that. But really, the meat of the discussion is about faith journeys, right? And, yeah. uh, and, and, and where we go and where we're led and, and, and how all this stuff happens. Because I think that, um, you know, from my experience and what I'm seeing, there's, uh, you know, there's studies, there's the Pew study that shows it. There's, uh, studies by public religion research associates that, um, uh, that show it, but, you know, faith, the nature of faith is changing generationally. It is changing all over the place uh, because um, uh, we're living in, in, in worlds that in some ways our institutions were not really prepared to move into, I think. That's yeah. at least my perspective. And I'd love to hear about your story because um, I'm acquainted with the Church of Christ, but I'm not really acquainted with what it might have been like to grow up in that environment. So, What's what's the Church of Christ known for? What are what's what are what's kind of the most public or most um, noticed feature of the of the Church of Christ? <clears throat> well, I think when people think of Churches of Christ, uh, especially in well, I guess not not especially anything, but when they think of Churches of Christ, they usually think no, non instrumental uh, okay. because none of the not none. I, I, need, I need to be careful of using expansive language because right because churches are all different and there's always right. these varying and, things yeah and that's one of the aspects of the churches of Christ is there's no central authority no governing body that says this is what we believe and this is how we should right. act but I mean there there kind of de facto is it's kind of like this group mind that it, you you can identify a church of Christ just by like walking in the door basically and <laughs> seeing okay there's no instruments um, there's no women preaching no, or or doing anything up front. Um, there's usually heavy, heavy emphasis on biblical study and knowledge. Um, baptism uh, is essential for the remission of sins, um, and adult baptism, not, ch- not babies or children. Um, I mean, the, the idea behind the Churches of Christ, which is, is a one that I am kind of actually exhibiting through my podcast, through the Let's shed everything else and go back to the beginning. Yeah. The idea was this, it's known as the Restoration Movement, which happened back in the 1700s, like otherwise known as the Stone Campbell Movement. Mm-hmm. And Which other Stone, was, Ma- other Stone Campbell Movement churches would also be the, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, correct? Yep, yep. And so there's a common root, but that's really, you know, that's a very progressive leading church, leaning church right. these days. And then there's the Church of Christ. So, it, you know, again, Christianity is so incredibly co- complex. I, uh, I think especially in this country, it's so diverse and so different. And and even within those denominational bodies, there's still, you know, so much uh, difference between church and church and church. So, yeah, keep going. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Yeah, the huge, huge variations. I mean, I, I know churches of Christ that have instruments, have women preachers, and uh, even are LGBTQ affirming. And so, I mean, there's not a whole lot of those, but they're out there. So, I mean, it's a very, it's a wide variation. But the, I would say, mainstream churches of Christ are kind of what I grew up at, 
uh, at here in Fort Collins. I was born here in Fort Collins. And uh, my parents were the first fa- uh, couple married in the Church of Christ here in Fort Collins, the, the building that we have now. And so I've been very involved in it, and it's been part of my life um, for a long time. My grandpa was a, you should call him a uh, domestic missionary for Churches of Christ. Um, he's from Texas, but they moved all around. They went to Iowa, uh, Oregon, Nebraska, all, all, all over the place, and ended up settling here. So I was very entrenched in the theology and the background of Churches of Christ. Like, and you, like you said, it's very um, conservative, and it's more of a, I would say, fundamentalist church. And it's also very exclusivistic. If that, is that a word? Yeah. I, <laughs> okay. it, do, you, do I understand what it means? Yes, I do. So therefore, it's a word. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very exclusivistic. Um, I grew up uh, hearing lots of sermons about how, why we're doing things because it's not like the Methodists or... The Baptists are doing it the wrong way, or the Catholics are doing. It. I have books about like why I'm not a Catholic and things yeah. like that. Um, and so the there was always this concept that yeah, there technically are probably Christians in other denominations just by accident maybe, but once they realize the truth, they'll come over and find a Church of Christ. And um, once again, huge variation even among members of a, of an individual church. It's not like we're all you know, mindless uh, automatons. But, um, you know, growing up in a very strict family and home in that tradition, I never really, I never until last month, I'd never gone to a church that was not a Church of Christ ever. Mm. I mean, I'd visited like cathedrals in Europe. Right. But never been to an actual worship service. Um, And so I, I had a very narrow picture of what the the larger christendom was other than they're wrong and we're right yeah so i i I served a church in upper east tennessee for a while that was right right on the other side of the ridge was a church of christ where purportedly um everyone that was a member of it believed that they were the only it wasn't just that that the church of christ was the only denomination where people were going to go to heaven but this specific congregation was the that was the only church where people would go to heaven out of that church. Yeah. And, and, and I, you know, I just lift that up not to make anybody kind of look bad or exclusivistic or, you know, see, I use the word there. Um, <laughs> but it's just, it's just the, the kind of notions that we, we sometimes have. Right. And, yeah. and when there is a, uh, when there becomes a focus, and I think it's a general disease of culture these days, which is, you know, just we've got to be right. And my, my group, it, they're the right, we're right, and you're wrong. And, and, um, and I think that's why it's so important to get out there and to, to learn and to be ha- and have an open mind and see what's going on. So a month ago, you, you went to another church. What did it feel like? What was, it, what did it, what was that like for you? Well, it was about as uh, 180 as, uh, degrees as you could get from a Church of Christ. It's actually, it was a United Church of Christ, which, similar name, very not similar uh, worship styles or belief systems. Um, and it, it, was, it was really interesting. Um, it was you know, a little bit more liturgical than a Church of Christ. Um, I, like, why is, this, why is the pastor wearing, like, this white robe and, like, this sash thing, <laughs> you know? Right. Um, the bread for communion was like soft, like sourdough bread. Like, wait, it's not a cracker. <laughs> they had actual wine, you know, for the for the communion. Um, so you know, there were, there were weird things like that, but I loved the the open and the uh, the accepting nature of the place. Um, and I, I mean, anybody who ever visited the church I grew up in it loved, like, very welcoming people, lovely, lovely people. Um, we'll bring anybody in and hug on them and, and uh, take care of them. So it's not that that wasn't different. It was just knowing that I was in a place that accepted um, LGBTQ people specifically, um, accepted anybody who like from where they were, and uh, had just there's just more of an open theology. Which you know my, my theology now is so different than what I grew up with. For, for lots of reasons, 
but uh, it was nice. It was just it was just an, a kind of a refreshing in a lot of ways, just probably from just the sheer difference of it. So I'm I'm always very curious about these kinds of transformations, and I think people in general are. I think anytime someone goes from a uh, uh, one point of view to another and makes a radical shift, I made one of those myself. Uh, when I was in seminary, I uh, was a stalwart, you know, Republican Christian, uh, Reagan conservative. Yep. And saw everything through that lens, and I went to a liberal seminary, and I think that the the fact that the professors were always kind of, you know, ragging on me really made me, like, dig in harder, right? Instead of really yeah. making me go, oh, gee, I think I was wrong, made me dig in harder, but it was a friendship, Um and I'll, I'll just share this with you because it's one of the really strange, it's, it's one of the great questions of my whole life um, that I still just can't quite wrap my head around. I had a really good friendship with a guy who was, you know, I was the Reagan Republican. He was the New York Times reading Democrat and, and socialist. Uh-huh. And, and, and we just, we were good friends, but man, every day at lunch, we just went head to head and, and and debated and every time i would say something he would say but steve what did jesus do and he kept press pressing that kind of issue what what was what did jesus say about that and and it made me go oh okay and then i did this whole flip well you know what else happened with that and why this is a big issue for me is that that um during that same time he got interested in collecting guns hmm. and very at, at the same time I was moving in this direction, he was moving in the other direction. Interesting. And so as he convinced me to be, you know, this kind of, you know, uh, liberal Christian, um, he was becoming a staunch conservative and, hmm. Um, and then later on, we reconnected later on, and he was sending me Ann Coulter books and stuff like that. And I was like, dude, what in the heck is going on here? Wow. And I'm still puzzled by that that change. I, you know, Of course, I can justify it on my own uh, realm, why I changed my mind, but I don't understand why he changed his in that direction, especially when he was so influential in, um, in, in kind of uh, making me who I am today. Um, and and as a result, we don't talk much. You know, it's just it's mm. painful to me. Um, and I'm and I'm wondering if was there any moment at which, you know, you can point to where you said you started to make this shift. You started to kind of question. Um, you know, what was what was a point? You you like talking about the wilderness. What was the what was the Exodus moment? What was the burning bush moment for you? Um. So. I, I I was very similar when I was younger. It sounds like to you, I was a hardcore Republican. I was part of the young Republicans in high school. Uh, I went to a Christian university, got my degree in biblical studies, and listened to Rush Limbaugh and Glenn Beck and Sean Hannity and all these guys, read Rush Limbaugh's book, and I wanted to do mission work in Germany. And my wife and I um, uh, decided to do, we ended up moving to eastern Germany, former communist area, to Dresden, Germany. And uh, we were there for three and a half years. And that, I think it was that entire experience that was kind of the the catalyst. Because from the political side of things, I realized, holy cow, there's a quote unquote socialist country. And these people are like, not they're they're happy <laughs> right like the things aren't crumbling down like things there's uh it's a beautiful place it's comfortable it's safe um and i started realizing how some of the policies of Amer- the american uh country at the time were affecting even the german people and i met a lot of refugees people from other countries and so i started like changing my political views then i think just kind of more toward the center. And then I remember I was standing in the the church auditorium one day, flipping through a German Bible, and I was learning German at the time. And I, I'm like, where's James? James? James isn't in the Bible. Where's the book? And this German guy's like, it's, oh, it's Jakobus. Because the name in Greek is Jacob, not James. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, it's a small thing, and there are reasons why. Um, 
there's a myth that you know King James wanted his name in the Bible, so he changed it. But apparently, that's not true. But um, it's fun to tell people. Uh, <laughs> Anything we can say about James, King James, you know, <laughs> right. I think it's, yeah. it's fair game. So um, just just the fact that the name was changed, I'm like, because I had been it had been drilled into my brain that the Bible was immutable and inerrant, the direct words of God, that kind of stuff. So that kind of sent me down the path of what's the stuff really saying? What's it not saying? How, what what else have I just assumed is is the way it should be? And maybe it's not. And uh, then came back to the States. Um, and I don't know, it's just like over time, I, I taught lots of classes at church. Uh, and I tended to teach classes of, about things that I really was struggling with. Mm-hmm. And so I, I taught a class about heaven and hell. And throughout the, the studies, I'm like, well, hell is not what we have been taught. The hell is. <laughs> this, is this is something completely different. Um, and then I, when I taught a class based on the book Misreading Scripture with Western Eyes, which is fantastic if you haven't read that. And it's, it's just about, about looking at Scripture from a different point of view and how we tend to just color everything with our American viewpoint. Yeah. And that, that kind of blew my mind up a little bit. And I, so, I do think that, excuse me, I'm about to... Go ahead. About to sneeze again. Oh, Gesundheit. I guess I am going to have to edit this after all. <laughs> <laughs> no, that that's one of the things that I find um, is is probably one of the most life altering experiences is travel, and and I think it's yeah. why maybe you know travel is such an incredibly important part of all world religions. It's you know the pilgrimage is a very big part of the Christian faith, and mm. uh, the Hajj in, in Islam. You know, is the, it's it's um, there is this this virtue and value of of getting out of your little parochial environment and going and experiencing something else and and um, you know finding that in Europe is certainly lovely but uh, Dresden's a beautiful city um, so thank you for that I mean and 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 really were, was it was it people was it just culture or just biblical questions or was it some combination of the of the bunch, I mean, what what do you think really kind of put you in that uh, that mode to search and to question? I'm I've always been somebody who I ask lots of questions. Uh, I think you know you know, like three year olds ask why constantly. <laughs> I've I never stopped. <laughs> yeah. And, um. And I've I've always been I've always tried to find the capital T truth because I I feel like there is truth out there. And so and my parents always instilled that in me. Once again, this uh, tradition of going back to the beginning, like the tra- the uh, Stone Campbell movement, like let's just be Christians. And so, I think that combined with the the travel and the um, and the the exposure to different people, it just makes you realize that so much of what your assumptions are may or may not be accurate because you assume that things are exactly one way. And then when you find out that parts of it are not that way, it, it opens you up to be more thoughtful and more contemplative about the other possibilities. And sometimes you realize that those possibilities are wrong and you were right to begin with. And sometimes you realize they weren't. And I think it takes courage and and uh, maybe a little uh, maybe a little insanity to <laughs> jump off the wagon sometimes and go the direction that you feel like you should go. And and there's most always a cost associated with um with with changing your mind changing your orientation yeah. when i became you know a professing christian i realized i had to leave behind a group of friends that were really dragging me down this is in high school you know but i also yeah. found a group of kids that were that were you know very good for me um so there was a plus and there was a minus um definitely you know through the years when i've ever ever had to stand up and make any kind of independent statement it has cost me you know dearly um and i you know you don't you can you can get into this if you want to or you can leave it alone you can dodge the question but has there been any cost to you um in in this exploration that you were taking uh oh yeah there has um 
when I not really a cost when we moved back from the state to, to the states from Germany um, we I mean my like I said my degree is in biblical studies and so that's I thought okay I've been a missionary for three and a half years I was kind of a youth minister before that and I realized that I I didn't feel like I I didn't I decided I, when I came back I, I will not ever again have a job that get that at a church where I get paid to do a thing at a church because partly it, I had seen the dark side of the church, the church leadership and how things work. And also I, I think I kind of had a sense that uh, I didn't want a somebody, I didn't want somebody else paying me to believe a thing because in a lot of ways, when you, when you are preaching at a church, when you're a pastor or whatever, you're paid to believe what that church believes. And if that ever shifts, you're in trouble. And you you have a choice. You can either try to change everybody's mind slowly, or you can um, state what you believe and possibly get fired, or you can go away and leave. And I didn't want to have to put myself in that situation. So I became a very active member of the church we were at and became a, a user experience designer on the side, well, as my main job. And taught a lot of classes, and I decided to, as I started having some of these newer views, I started slowly teaching these classes and trying to slowly change people's minds, and it, I realized after a while it wasn't working. And then, um, as I have heard from many people in my situation, Trump came along, and not to get all political, but the things he was representing and the things he was saying were so diametrically opposed to what Jesus would have done. I saw so many of my fellow Christians supporting that, and it kind of kicked off another round of, if the folks that I'm supposed to be following and modeling myself after are following this kind of person, what else is wrong? <laughs> what else am I missing? And uh, so through, the, the, through the, his presidency, uh, it was kind of a slow burn. And then through the pandemic, it kind of kicked up a notch because I finally had the chance to step back and kind of let things process through and did a lot more study and a lot more prayer and thought through, through things. And I realized I need to go someplace where I, I, I can express these feelings and express these beliefs without being clamped down on. And... We decide, so we decided to leave our church, and once again, like as we, as I've said earlier, I'm very public about stuff, and especially since I'm, I've been so um, so involved in the church I was at here, I, I was a deacon in charge of worship and adult ed and all kinds of things, and my wife was in charge of uh, a children's education for a long time. Uh, I I put I, I sent a letter to our, our leadership and let it stew for a while, and didn't really hear anything back from them. And then so then I posted the letter on Facebook to just our friends about why we were leaving, and that blew up. <laughs> um, and I have people at our church who are friends who will not speak to me anymore. I have family who, when they come into town, that like they specifically told me, we're going to be in town, but we do not want to see you. Mm. Um, maybe we'll be, well, we might see you at the park for a little bit, but that's it. Uh, my parents are having a hard time dealing with it, and they haven't really spoken to me in a couple months. So, the when I it's when I moved to, when I made my beliefs public, and it wasn't so much even in the moving away. It's some of the beliefs that I I'm, I'm holding now have really really kicked back hard, and that that's been a hard one. Yeah. Wow. Um, do you have any regrets? Uh, if by regret you mean I wish I had done something different, I think I think I still would have done the same thing. Um, it may have softened the blow to have had more discussions about this with my family ahead of time, but I think the end result would have been the same because it would have been a, a, a fruitless discussion about trying to change my mind back to the way it was before trying to bring me back into the fold. Because 
as, a, as I've stated, the, the exclusivistic nature of the way I grew up is if you don't, <clears throat> if you're not part of the churches of Christ, uh, then your salvation is questionable. And my family loves, loves me. The people at my church that I grew up in love me. And I love them too. But when, when I'm holding positions and believing things that they think are going to send me to hell, it really strains the relationship. And so that's that's been the difficult part. Yeah, yeah. Um, have you found any, um, and maybe it's too early in the state, in, in the process, but um, I mean, I love the, I love the idea of the wilderness and I love the fact that your, your podcast is based on that. Cause I think it's such an incredible image. You've got, you've got the call from the burning bush and then you've got, mm-hmm. you know, this courage that it takes to, to bring about um, the, the journey into the wilderness, out of slavery, into the wilderness. But then the wilderness is, is a terrible place. It's not fun. It's not, uh, yeah. it's not a water park. It's not, you know, it's, it's a dry, arid place where there's no food, there's no water, and you really can, you know, they were, the, the Israelites were not joking around when, you know, they said, well, you, brought, Moses, you brought us out here to, to kill us all. We're going to die. Yeah. So, so we're going to go back, you know, we were, it, yeah, slavery, that was fine uh, because we had, you know, three right. square meals and we had a place, you know, a bed to live in and, and uh, you know, it's, it it's not perfect, but we could we could die out here in the wilderness and mm-hmm. and you really do wonder i mean we know the we know how the story ended right we know we know how the story resolves itself but but this is one of the truly great stories of humanity because this is the human experience you leave a place and then you go out into the wilderness and it's scary it's really really scary what's been the thing that sustained you in the wilderness hmm well, I, honestly, it's been it's been helpful with with all the technology we have <laughs> to be able to connect virtually with a lot of other people, like like we are now, um, like I am, like my podcast host Nathan. Um, uh, actually, Nathan and his entire family, parents and brother, and everybody have have all left the church I went to at the same time as me, r- roughly. And a couple other families have left as well for a lot of the same reasons. And so we have like, there's like 14 or 15 of us who kind of keep in touch. Kind of, it's kind of a support group. <laughs> yeah, sure. In a way. Uh, and my, uh, and that's, that's just other people is really, was really the key. Other people who understand where I'm coming from, who have similar backgrounds or some not, not similar. I've, I've actually, I've gotten more active on Twitter again. And some of there's some people. On, in the Twitterverse, um, who kind of going through this deconstruction thing, trying to figure out what's what's going on with with their faith, and that's some of that's been really really uh, encouraging. And and what are you? It, it, are you, I think I think in a previous discussion you were telling me that uh, um, that in this in this deconstructionist reconstructionist kind of thing that's going on right now, there's a lot of people that just say. Screw it! I'm done. I'm I'm done with faith completely. Yeah. Um. Sure. And and that's got to be a temptation for you. Um. That's got to be a place where you could go to. I could, but, but you don't. Yeah. I. <clears throat> so, kind of, alongside all of this deconstruction stuff, I was going through. Uh, four years ago. I was diagnosed with young onset Parkinson's disease. And then I was two years after that, I was additionally diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And so through that, um, like when I got diagnosed with Parkinson's, it was not a good thing. I didn't feel great about it, but I wasn't mad at God at least. I kind of worked through it and I I made things work. But then when MS came along, I'm like, okay, what what in the world? And that's when I started getting mad at God. And that's when I kind of started chugging through a lot of this anger and issues and even to the point like, does God even exist? Because you, we hear, especially you've been a pastor before, and 
when you're in ministry, people ask you that question all the time. Like, what? Like, why is there evil in the world? Why is there sickness and pain if, if God's so good? And I always had an answer. There's lots of answers. Sure. But until it hits you in the gut or in the brain like me, yeah, it, it does, it's, it's not the same. And so I got to that point and like I had to wrestle through some of that stuff. And uh, I'm still, you know, kind of trying to figure it out myself, and I don't have an answer to the problem of pain for sure. But um, I, I did realize that I needed God through all that, and I wasn't ready to give it all up because not only did I need God, I needed the people of God, and I think that's why we have the church. And I didn't want to give that up, <clears throat> and so the it was very difficult leaving the church I I was in because it was a, very much of a, a family. And we tried our best to leave well, leave in a way that we could maintain those relationships. And we thought we were doing that, but it blew up in our face and it didn't work that way. So we're trying to find another community of believers that we can kind of do this thing together with. Um, and so I completely lost what, what your question was. Doesn't matter. It was a great answer. Yeah, okay. it's, it's it's a great answer. Yeah. Well, I uh, I really appreciate this, and I appreciate your candor and your uh, your ability to to you know to talk about it. I uh, really really appreciate it. I think you've given all of us some, something very precious and very uh, very uh, you know a real treasure in in speaking this this story that you have. Sure. So thank you for that, and um, um, you know you. I always hope these conversations will connect with somebody who is basically dealing with the same kinds of stuff. And, you know, again, we're living in an age where, um, you know, answers are all around and, uh, and, and some of them are, are polar opposites, um, to each other. And, um, and, and yet it, it seems to still be that, that answers are not so important, but relationships are. Uh, oh, yeah. questions are, um, places, um, travel, things like that. Um, and I, I think, you know, if I might say, uh, uh, you know, I can be a little bit patronizing cause I'm older than you, but Hey, you know, uh, <laughs> the Stephen D Martins are onto something here. Um, um, how do we find, how do we, how do we access your podcast? How do we, uh, how do we find out about all the things you're doing out there? Uh, well, if you go to, if any any podcast app search for following the fire, uh, that'll it ought to find it. There's it's also followingthefire.com. dot com, and all the links and everything is there. All so. right, and, and but you won't be able to find you by going to stephendmartin.com dot com because no. that's <laughs> that's me, man. <laughs> well, if, if you're you can send me confusing emails at stevemartin.me. dot me. <laughs> and if yeah, if you want to look, search for us on Facebook, just you know, I'm I'm sure there's right. plenty of other Steve Martins <laughs> out there that will be happy to answer your friend request. Um, and if you if you can think of a Steve Martin joke that nobody else has told me, you get a prize. Oh right, <laughs> and it'll be a good one because yeah, yeah, I get it. Um, gosh, so many stories, so many stories. Um, just one guy. This was had to have been in the like. 2000s I was in a radio shack in the mall and this guy you know takes my takes my payment they always have to ask your name and your phone number at radio shack or at least they yeah. did when radio shack was actually right, alive right. but um and, you know he he's looking down at the counter and he looks at at uh he's writing it down and he just looks up with this look of complete delight and discovery you know as if he was the first person to ever come up with this connection and he just looked at me with all the satisfaction in the world and said are you a wild and crazy guy yeah yeah the yeah. pain is real the suffering is real yeah what makes you feel old though is when the the cashier does not get the joke right <laughs> like yeah i'm old now <laughs> and we can all be grateful too that uh you know steve martin's ended up being a Fairly respectable guy. Um, Absolutely. There's a lot of famous names we could have that wouldn't be so great to walk around with. Um, <laughs> I just, yeah. we're going to close on one thing. Okay. I'm going to explain why I didn't, you know, decide to go with another 
name. I didn't really want to go around with a famous name. It would have been nice to avoid that. But I hate my middle name so much that I'm not even going to speak it out loud here. (laughs) I hate it so much that I just, I was willing to tolerate all the Steve Martin shtick, um, you know, in spite of it, because I just didn't want to even acknowledge my middle name. So why have you stuck with Steve Martin? Well, the alternative is my middle name is Dean. So I've got Dean Martin on top of things. <laughs> <laughs> that is just beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And get this, get this. My next door neighbor is Stephen King. <laughs> Not the Stephen King, but a, a Stephen King. <laughs> just beautiful, just beautiful. Yeah. Steve, this has been fun. Uh, thank you so much for the good conversation. And uh, Anytime, I think man. I think sometime I'm going to be on yours, right? Absolutely. You know, yeah. and then and then we have to discuss the possibility of doing a podcast together because yeah. you know I just I can't I think I, I just I'm my mind is running crazy with all the the intro possibilities, you know. <laughs> Your host, Stephen D. Martin and Stephen D. Martin. I, you know, it's just, it's endless. <laughs> it's just so much fun we could have. So, uh, all right, man. Thank you so much and have a blessed day. You too, man. Thanks. Bye. As it turns out, right after I recorded this interview, I recorded an interview with him for his podcast. And so we are actually releasing both of these podcasts on the same day. How about that? Just for fun. And I urge you to check out his podcast, Following the Fire, and subscribe and check out what he and, you know, what he's doing on that great podcast or really thinking about and probing through some really, really difficult faith questions. And, uh, you know, this is the time for it. And this is such a great medium. So, hey, I'm going to sign off now. Thanks for listening. Do please check in on us at the Lakelands Institute and keep coming back. I'm going to try to get a feel a little bit more regular in posting these episodes, but I really, really appreciate you listening today. Take care.